perhaps I'll, I'll give you some background be, be, while it, it's working through here. Um, I began my career as a, as a fisheries biologist out in the Cook Islands, uh, 15 tiny little islands out in the South Pacific uh, between Tonga and Tahiti. And my init initially I was charged to manage the commercial fisheries, uh, to conduct the, the, the research to manage the commercial fisheries for the cooks. And it very soon became apparent to me that we need to be doing much more than just managing commercial fisheries. That we need to start to, as everybody here in this room is aware, that we need to move from the hunter-gatherer tradition in the oceans to starting to culture our fish in the oceans. And so over the years, we've been developing open ocean mariculture, originally pearl oyster culture uh, throughout the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, and more recently uh, focusing on marine fish for the same reason that Willie Sutton robs banks, <laughs> because that's where the money is. Uh, we had established a moored operation in Kona, uh, growing Kona Kampachi out a half mile out offshore in 200 feet of water. And we had bumped up very quickly there in that operation there. We bumped up against the limitations of permitting. And so we had then come to uh, realise that perhaps in some way the future lay offshore. And in Hawaii, because of the steep drop off, the very quickly, as you move out offshore, at some point you have to say, it's so deep out here, do you really have to put the anchor down? And so we started to look at the potential for drifter pens, something that has been in science fiction for uh, the last 10 or 20 or 30 years. But we've been able to actually put it into practice at a research scale. It's what we like to call fish without footprints. And it, it, it's the Valella concept is the name that we use for the trialling that we've been doing here. And perhaps we might propose that this, the nine months the drift that we had here in the Valella beta test over the last year might perhaps be Seastead 1.0. This is a graphic that I think really rams home very vividly the crisis in seafoods and, and the degree of pillage and plunder that we have visited upon our mother ocean. This is the North Atlantic 110 years ago where red is biomass of table fish. That's where it's over 11 uh, tonnes per square kilometre of biomass. So red is really good, lots of fish. Pale blue is diddly squat. That's 110 years ago. That's 10 years ago. Folks, the fish are gone. And they're probably not going to come back. They're certainly not going to come back to the point where they were 110 years ago. So this really is an economic opportunity before us, but it's an ecological imperative. Now, capture fisheries production is, it's not going to go up. You can't squeeze any more blood out of that stone. At best, it's going to be flat. 90% of the large fish in the ocean are gone already. And Worms paper back in 2006 had predicted that if we don't change the way that we are managing the oceans by 2048, all of the fish stocks there will have collapsed. And by collapsed, it means down to less than 10% of their original biomass. Do you think things have changed much since 2006? I don't know. Perhaps in the US, Australia and New Zealand, fisheries management is starting to move towards more rational level. Starting to see some hints of it in Europe. But there was a tremendous incentive for people to keep fishing. For example, the Atlantic bluefin tuna was proposed for red listing under CITES. Uh, back in 2010. Of course it didn't get red listed. There are so many people out there that love their bluefin tuna. It probably should have been from a biological scientific perspective. But there is increasing recognition of the potential for aquaculture. Uh, in last year there was a, a study, Blue Frontiers, by uh, Conservation International and uh, World Fish Institute that it concluded that of all of the animal protein production systems out there on the planet, that aquaculture was far and away the most environmentally responsible. That's coming from Conservation International. They got a lot of heat over that, but they stood by it because of the, the validity of these arguments. And most recently, there's been an initiative from uh, World Bank, IUCN, WWF, 
a number of the, the leading environmental organisations and uh, development agencies have come together and they're planning a, an ocean program. It's going to be put forward at the Rio Plus 20 here. And a key element of this responsible ocean program is aquaculture. So we can change minds, just can we change them fast enough? A little bit of background on Kampachi Farms. Uh, we're open ocean aquaculture. I'd worked originally with a co-founder in Kona Blue Water Farms, which had established the offshore operation in Kona that produced Kona Kampachi. Uh, last year we spun off Kampachi Farms, which has got two focuses. One is on the R&D for next generation technologies in open ocean mariculture, such as the Valella system or the, the Polky Pen, which is a polar circle Kiko net system. It's man, many, marrying a new mesh, uh, monofilament mesh, to the traditional uh, salmon, sea bass, sea brim cage systems. We're also looking at new species development. The group that I introduced you to yesterday afternoon, uh, we're looking at yellowfin tuna hatchery development and production of, of herbivorous fish in the hatchery. And we're working towards alternative feed stuff, soy proteins and oils now. And in the future, who knows, macroalgae extracts or other feed stuffs that we might be able to use. At the same time, we're looking at geographical expansion of Kampachi, uh, the uh, yellowtail amberjack that, that we've been culturing there. Uh, the key drivers here are water quality, proximity to market, and scalability. We have to be able to take this to scale for it to be uh, commercially viable. So we're looking at, at US federal waters because of the limitations, the permit limitations in, in state waters. We're looking at federal waters in, in uh, Kona and Texas, but there are some significant hurdles there. Uh, yes, no has come out with an affirming national aquaculture policy, but it's going to be at least a year or two or three, it is the federal government after all, before we actually have a regulatory framework for uh, aquaculture in federal waters in the Gulf. And then that's going to have to then be developed in each of the separate regions independently. We are focused very much on commercial expansion in La Paz, uh, in the tip of the Baja Peninsula in Mexico, and we're also looking at projects in Oman and, and Ecuador. But the Valella project, specifically, a, a, as one of these next generation technologies for Campachi Farms, I want to talk about the, the, the essential concept, the deployment and, and performance of the fish, and then where are the next steps. So the, the concept is rooted, as I'd said, in the, uh, the constraints that we felt when we were there in Kona Blue Water Farms when we were producing uh, the Kona Kampachi there off the airport in Kona. In 2008, we produced over a million pounds of sashimi-grade fish. There are no measurable environmental impacts once you moved away from the immediate cage area. Underneath the cages, yes, there's some shadowing, and when you clean the pens, there's some macroalgae there. The current picks up and blows that away. It's a sand bottom over 200 feet of water. But there's no measurable environmental impact. You cannot tell the difference between the water quality up current of the pens and down current of the pens. And yet still, when we came here, we thought that this, so the solution to the seafood crisis was, was Kona Kampachi. And Fortune magazine embraced the story as well. But we very quickly, uh, came up against the issue of scale, that to really get this operation to profitability, we needed to be far more than the 500 tonnes a year. We figured perhaps 1,500 tonnes a year, 3,000 tonnes a year. We've got a global seafood crisis out there. Of course, we've got to be bigger than 500 tonnes a year. And there were uh, restrictions from the state, both in, in the, the type of pens that we could use and the amount of area that we could use and how we were going to operate there. And so, as we sat around and furrowed our brows and worked on our ulcers about this, at some point there we said, what about if we could just drift the cage out there? The reason why a drifter cage is attractive to us is because of the need for scalable growth, environmentally responsible growth. As you move, as aquaculture scales, we have to move to sites that are going to be deeper and further offshore. There are also other advantages to unanchored pens because you don't occupy any fixed area. You don't need a lease. Uh, it's also from a farm management perspective. In terrestrial agriculture, we have adopted the practice. Uh, we, you have to adopt the practice. 
of fallowing, of, of rotating your crops. Uh, and this is something that, that salmon and sea bass in, in uh, finfish aquaculture in the ocean, they have also adopted this practice here as well. If you're an unanchored pen, if you don't have any footprint, then you're essentially perpetually fallow. And so this would also perhaps have some benefits for fish health because farmed fish in and of themselves aren't unhealthy. It's just that they catch bugs from the wild fish and then they will proliferate inside the pens there in any monoculture. It's true of any uh, agricultural system. The bugs that we encounter in farming cows or sheep or wheat come from wild systems and then we just, the, the, the monoculture that we have proliferates those. But so here with a drifter pen, if we could create some geographical disconnect between the reef, the source where, where the wild fish are, uh, and our pristine, beautiful, cultured fish out in the open ocean, perhaps there would be some advantages for fish health here. As I said, people have sat and stared out into the blue and thought about the potential for drifter cages for some time now. And generally it's been on the sense of, of trans-ocean drifters, that you put the fish in the pen in Los Angeles, and you push them out from shore, and about a year later they wash up into Tokyo Harbour and you can harvest all the bluefin tuna. Or you, you put them in the cage in Miami and push them out, and a year later they'll wash up in London. Uh, there are some real significant challenges to this. Um, first of all, as everybody has pointed out, it, it gets really snotty out there. Really snotty. If you haven't sat through a force 7 or force 8, you need to spend more time at sea to really understand how much the sea wants to break whatever you put out there. <laughs> there also biosecurity concerns. In aquaculture, this is huge. You want to be able to control uh, the influx and efflux of um, fish, the fish that you are culturing or other creatures from your geographical area. And so the idea of taking fish from one side of the ocean and moving them to the other side of the ocean is a huge no-no. You just don't want to do that. Um, there are the questions of feed delivery. Uh, if you're going to go and uh, grow uh, perhaps a, a 500 tonnes of fish in one pen, it might be 1,000 tonnes of fish in one pen, you're going to need to have double that in terms of feed biomass. So you're talking about 1,000 tonnes or 2,000 tonnes of feed when you push it out. Or you're going to have to be delivering feed when it's out in the middle of the ocean. It's a long way from... Uh, shore out to the middle of the ocean and you've got to go and find your cage and get deliver the feed to them. And there's also then the problems of when you get this big sophisticated cage system and when it does wash up into the uh, Tokyo Harbour, how do you get it back to Los Angeles? It's a long way. So we thought about this and we said, great idea, yeah, science fiction, but sitting there in, in Kona working at the Natural Energy Lab for the last 22 years. Good grief, is it that long, Pat, since you dragged me out of Sydney to Kona? It's a tremendous place, actually, to uh, be doing this sort of cutting-edge next-generational research. The Natural Energy Lab is a wonderful incubator facility. There's nothing like it on the planet. Um, but sitting there at the very western tip of the Big Island for the last 20-odd years and watching the currents roar by and doing fishing and diving and surfing out there offshore, we start to understand a little bit about the, the current systems. And this is an idealised uh, uh, diagram of what happens with the currents in the back of the big island of Hawaii, the larger of the green masses here. But essentially it's like the, a rock in the middle of a river where the water flows uh, past the rock and you get these little eddies and whirlpools in, in the back of, of the rock, which will spin around for a while. And the cyclonic eddies, the, the, the blue ones that are up in the northern half here, actually there, this is, as, as I said, stylized. Usually the, the cyclonic eddies predominate uh, and they sit around the middle of the big island and they stay there for months at a time. And our thinking was, well, perhaps we could have a pen that would just sit out there in that eddy for months at a time and occasionally you only need to go out and do course corrections. And then as the eddy will propagate off to the west eventually, then you jump from one eddy to the next one as it starts to form. And so we went out and we did some testing here. We had some support from the National Science Foundation to go out and explore this idea. Uh, we dropped <coughs> GPS track buoys out there uh, into the eddy and they went round and round like the Indy 500. And we thought, this is great. Uh, and, and so th then we thought about, let's take this to the next scale. Rather than just doing this with an empty cage, 
uh, perhaps we could do this as a beta test and actually put some fish out there. And uh, the Illinois Soybean Association, bless their hearts, the US soybean industry are tremendous advocates uh, and facilitators for the, for the development of open ocean mariculture. Um, they recognise that people would much rather pay for uh, sashimi rather than eat tofu, and they see it as a great market for their fish in the future. And they said, well, we'd like to support you in going doing this beta test. The commercial criteria here, when we looked at this, what was it going to need to make this, um, to be able to show that this was economically viable? Well, there, there's the cost of, of positioning, of either the, the um, using a, a deep water parachute anchor to control the position or using diesel fuel uh, to tow the array around. We also tested using sail power, but wind power doesn't really move pens through the water very effectively. And then the cost of supporting it when you're, you're far offshore, when, when you're 10 or 50 or 100 miles offshore, that's a lot of logistical support to and fro to get fuel and, and labour backwards and forwards. So they're the costs, that, that falls into the red column, but then the potential advantages are that you can scale this. You can do it in an environmentally sound manner, in a demonstrably environmentally sound manner. Remember, a million pounds a year had no measurable impact, but at some stage in near shore waters, even if you're within a mile or two of the shoreline, you're going to either run up against biological, ecological limits, or you're going to run up against just competing user groups in near shore waters. And so the further out offshore you go, the more you're going to be able to scale this, both in a biological sense and in a regulatory sense. We wanted to also wonder whether there would be improved uh, growth performance by the fish out in the drifter pen because they wouldn't be swimming so hard against the current. Uh, there might be the fish health benefits that we uh, were anticipating. And there might also be adv advantages here. Instead of having a, a pen that was designed to withstand the currents, that it would be something that, that and so something that looks actually more like a, a, a bunker, perhaps it would be something that would look more like a space station, that if you're moving with the current, if there is no apparent current, that perhaps that would allow you then to be more creative in the pen designs. We also wanted to test here um, the, the new development in, in brass mesh netting. This is, these are now being applied in Chile uh, to significant effect and we wanted to test these with our fish to see if it would reduce or eliminate predation or entanglement problems. God help the fish farmer in the US that ever gets a marine mammal entangled in their netting. Uh, marine Mammal Protection Act is a very, very robust piece of legislation. Uh, we also, because we get paid for the fish, you want to risk, reduce the risk of them escaping because that's, uh, that, that, that's your revenue swimming away down there. We also wanted to look at, at, at whether the, the brass would reduce the biofouling and that would perhaps lead to better fish health and better feed conversion ratios. That's an, uh, the acronym FCR there. And that's essentially how much feed you have to feed, how many pounds of fish feed you have to put in to get a pound of great tasting sashimi out the other side. So then the deployment. We were able to, uh, in May of last year, we deployed a single aquapod Pen. This is 132 cubic metres. Uh, we have, in the moored operation, we were doing 3,000 cubic metre pens. When we envisage the commercial operation in La Paz, we're talking about 12,000 cubic metre pens here. So that just gives you an idea of the scale here. 2,000 fish into this pen here. But we successfully launched it in May. We had some uh, great coverage from National Geographic uh, that's going to be part of Bob Ballard's uh, Alien Deep special that's going to be released later this year. Bob Ballard, the guy who found the Titanic, is a great advocate for seasteading and, and for open ocean aquaculture. Uh, the first couple of months, we were waiting for the permits from NOAA. Uh, even though it's federal waters, you still do, do need to get permits from folk to put the fish in the pen. But we didn't need a permit to put the pen out there. So for the first couple of months, we just tracked uh, the drift of, of this. We were hoping that perhaps we might be 5% of the time that we'd need to tow. It actually worked out to be perhaps, uh, <coughs> for this two months here, it was around 20% of the time. I'll talk some about the reasons for that challenge later. The drift range was between 7 and 75 miles uh, offshore there. You see, it, it, we were able to stay and trained in the eddies pretty well for most of the time, but there'd still need to be a fair bit of towing just to keep the course corrections uh, or to do things like come in and, and pick up the fish. We had to come in closer to shore to pick up the fish that were stocked here. Uh, 2,000 
uh, of the Kampachi in July of last year. Uh, these were at about 180 grams, so that's about that big of a fish. It's about 10 times the size of what we normally stock offshore because we were waiting for the permits from NOAA. But what this actually meant was, was that we didn't need to put an internal nursery net, which uh, may have, have been in, in incidentally beneficial. They don't have the additional biofouling on an internal nursery net. So we had minimal post-transform mortality, less than 2% because the fish were so large. And we might normally expect a, a, a far two, two or three times that number there in post-transform mortality. But let's look at how the fish did in, in the growth performance. It was absolutely astonishing. The growth rate was perhaps twice as fast as that which we expected. They reached a harvest size of four pounds within four months, when in a normal system we expect them to reach that size within about eight months. The, uh, we had the first harvest in, in December, which was three months ahead of schedule. We had to get some fish out of there because we were bumping up against the density limits because the, the growth was so fast and the survival was so good there. Um, we had the final harvest in February with a mean size of almost uh, around five and a half pounds. The feed conversion ratio was about 1.6 to 1. For most of the grow out cycle, it had been very close to 1 to 1. And it was only we pushed the fish up to a, a harvest size larger than what we normally harvest at, and the feed conversion ratio naturally falls to hell as things get larger there. But for most of the grow out, it was around 1 to 1, whereas normally we would expect 1.8 or 2 to 1. That's a significant. Uh, delta there in terms of the economic viability. And as I said, the survival rate was phenomenal. We saw almost no other mortality after that initial dropout of 2% after the stocking. We were also able to uh, institute so, some uh, innovative management techniques for uh, the ectoparasite that is a major management I issue here for Seriola, not just on our operations, but for Yellowtail and Amberjacks and Hamachi worldwide. We, as I said, we were hoping to be able to avoid uh, the uh, fish health issues by moving out offshore. No such luck. There are some fish that will swim as we're getting in close within sort of five or ten miles of shore. We're seeing rainbow runners around the aquapod and they migrate from deep water around the reefs. They're from the same family as Seriola and so my ulcer started to give me hell as soon as we saw the rainbow runners around the cage. And sure enough, after a couple of months, we did have this typical proliferative spike uh, of where the skin flukes are about the size of a flea and they themselves aren't an issue for the, uh, aren't that big of an issue for fish health uh, any more th th than fleas are for a dog. But as with a dog, the fish will try and scratch themselves because they get itchy and so they'll rub on the side of the mesh, they'll break the mucus, it'll break the skin, they'll get a secondary infection and, and then you've got an issue. And so normally what we'd have to do is uh, use chemical therapeutics such as hydrogen peroxide to control skin flukes. What we're able to do here with the Valella project because we're able to manage this one independent pen in and of itself is that we could start to manage for the bugs here. And so we started what we call the perpetual motion machine or a very slow tow uh, between a tenth of a knot and a quarter of a knot forward so we had a unidirectional current there so all of the skin fluke eggs went to the back of the pen and then when they hatched they went out behind the pen there and then we also started regular pressure washing of the brass mesh very minimal biofouling on the brass mesh but we still wanted to be uh, wanted to be double insurance so we, we had our dive crew out, out there on uh, the, the dive platform accompanying this the, the Machias the 65 foot steel hull vessel there so they were out there all the time. They might as well have been cleaning the pen there. What we saw was just filled us with elation, uh, is that we were able to reduce the neobenadinia infection rate over the course of the grout here without using any therapeutics here. It's, to our knowledge, it's the first time it's ever been accomplished, a full grow-out cycle of seriola uh, without any infestation. Why? Part of the beauty of biology is you don't really know that you can't, there's no simple answers to these things. We have a, a couple of hypotheses as to what we saw there in, in terms of the phenomenal growth in FCR and survival rates here. As I said, it, it, it le there's less apparent current. The fish aren't having to sit there and hold their position uh, against a, a vigorous current. At, at a moored site, the current might be a, a knot or two, or sometimes it might even spike up to three at some sites. And so here our fish were just 
motoring along very nicely at, at a tenth of a knot or a quarter of a knot. So that meant fish will use protein for, for energy, they'll use uh, as well as the lipids, they'll use protein. And so any of the protein in their diet that they're not using for energy is available for um, anabolism, for, for building up body mass there. It might also have been that just being out further offshore in deeper water, there was less stress. There's been some work done with southern bluefin tuna down in South Australia that uh, had looked at the, the uh, stress hormones in southern bluefin tuna that were grown in shallow water closer to shore and, and then deeper water further offshore, and also the survival of these fish and found that the deeper site further offshore that the fish were less stressed and there was less mortality there. But that's, you can understand that for tuna, but for the kampachi, it's naturally in on the reef, so you might think it might be happier, less stressed if it was in close to the reef. We don't really know. Uh, we'd like to go and look at this further, but just stop for a minute and think about th these huge levers here in terms of the economic viability of growing kampachi have all been pushed way forward. Th th there is, this creates here an incentive for us to, to um, look at what is it about the open ocean that works so well. We aren't being pushed out offshore anymore by the regulatory framework uh, or, or by the objections from other nearshore users. Here is a potential for us to be pulled out there, that there is an economic incentive for us to be out further and deeper. There are, however, as folk have mentioned, there, there are significant challenges. Um, Michael Jones is actually the CFO of the company that creates uh, the, the little benthic vehicle here, Seabotics. Um, th th this vehicle here we've been using for some of the uh, remote command and control uh, work that, that's so important to reduce the labour factor here uh, on the offshore operation. But the, uh, the, 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 there were three technological challenges that we encountered. One was that the eddy models using the satellites to try and track the eddies out offshore, that that just didn't work. We really didn't have a clue. There were Navy models of the eddies and sometimes they were in complete contradiction to each other. Or they'd been in complete contradiction. We could track using GPS where the pen was and they were, it was in complete contradiction to the Navy models. There was also huge challenges as we're trying to do more of this uh, command and control remotely through the satellite. Uh, just the bandwidth on the satellite w w was very constrictive. And we worked with Lockheed Martin and Ocean Farms Technologies that designed these pens, trying to look at ways to optimise the pens to minimise the drag and maximise the operational functionality of it. And the big conclusion was, well, the sphere that you've got is probably about as good as you're going to get because you're minimising the surface area to volume ratio there. And apparently the engineers tell us it doesn't matter which way you're dragging mesh through the water. It's all one or the other. The, uh, the other findings that we found in terms of marine mammal interactions, there were a lot of marine mammal interactions. These were photos that were taken from our divers on the villa. We did have humpback whales come up and go, ooh, what's that? <laughs> uh, but there are 59 uh, encounters that we had over the, the times that we were on resident there. There was no contact, and that's what Noah would be really worried about, if there was any contact or entanglement or any change in their behaviour. They'd come and they'd hang around for an hour or two or a, perhaps a day, and then they head on off. They've got other things to do, other fish to fry. Uh, we did have some other charismatic megafauna, as we like to say. These critters here, are, 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 maybe someday, but, but they're just like big puppy dogs. They all come up and nuzzle you while you're trying to work on the pen, and you've got to slap them away. Uh, we also had other friends out there would come and visit fairly regularly. Uh, when we would also have, when we were within 10 or 15 miles of shore, uh, it, it, it's a little spooky when you're diving and you get these guys buzzing over the head, dragging their plastic lures. But uh, the, the Valella act, acted as a tremendous fish aggregating device here. And so for the local fishermen, they loved it. Uh, and Veterans Day last year, we had 16 vessels that were clustered around. Why? The fish aggregating device, it's a fishing buoy, that's where the tuna like to aggregate. Wherever the tuna like to aggregate, that's where the fishermen like to aggregate. So the biological performance was phenomenal and no measurable impact on marine mammals or other issues. The fishermen loved us. The technology, eh, it's challenging. Where do we go from this next? Well, we did the beta test. 
Let's go to gamma. Let's run through the Greek alphabet here. The next test is going to be a replication of this on a single point mooring. Okay, the drifting around didn't work. Let's put it on, put an anchor out there. But let's try and retain the deep water attributes of what we're collecting. Let's do it in perhaps 6,000 feet where we've started the permit application process with NOAA. Bless their hearts, the Honolulu office of NOAA has been very supportive of this research here. So six nautical miles offshore from Kona in 6,000 feet of water. The challenge here for the gamma test is, can we resolve these technological challenges uh, by mooring the pen? We don't care about the eddies. Um, by using being within range of 3G, 4G broadband, the narrow bandwidth of the satellite isn't an issue for us. And by having an anchor there, we don't care so much about the, the drag on the mesh band. We're not trying to optimise around that. Can we do this and then still retain the phenomenal biological benefits that we saw there in terms of fish growth and feed conversion ratio? Uh, we will still have a unidirectional current uh, through this pen, so can we uh, control the ectoparasites there? And can we actually demonstrate through this gamma test here, can we demonstrate that this is ready to roll out uh, as a mariculture model here? A single point mooring, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is just that it's one point that you're anchored on. And so when the current blows one direction, your pen and your feed barge, we would move to a feed barge here for more aut automation rather than the steel hulled schooner that we had at the, the beta test. So the pen and, and the feed barge would drift off towards your left and then as the current turns around, it spins around and moves around to your right. Uh, we'd have in 6,000 feet of water, uh, we'd have 10,000 feet or more uh, of uh, radius in there. If you look at this in plan view, this is the anchor in the centre there, and you can see the arrow there that shows uh, the current direction. As the current swings around, then the pen's going to swing around with it as well. From a biological, ecological footprint perspective, okay, maybe it's not completely fish without footprints, but it's pretty darn close. With a 10,000 foot radius there, you've got about 12 square miles of surface area for your 2,000 fish. Uh, you also then, because the, the current is always going to move in one direction through the pen there, you have unidirectional current, we should hopefully have also the same uh, fish health benefits there. So what would this mean on a commercial scale? If we take the growth performance benefits and uh, the uh, efficiency improvements that we saw in the Valella beta test and we apply it to the economic model that we have for our La Paz commercial plan here. Uh, and we look at the, the, the basic numbers that, that, that any uh, investor is going to look at here about gross and net and uh, your, your cash at, say, the critical juncture here, four-year cash and the internal rate of return. For the conventional La Paz plan, which I'm happy to talk to any of you about later, um, it's, it's a net of around 6% by year four, uh, return over the whole 10 years of the project of around 33%. Uh, and year four, you're doing okay. Uh, you've had a $10 million investment and you're back to, you, you, you're still uh, 3.2 million, but that's a fairly decent buffer. If you go and apply these growth performance and efficiency parameters onto this financial model, then you get a net of around 53%. You get a year four cash of around 45 million and you get an internal rate of return of over 150%. And that's aspirational because we've done this at a research scale and we've done it once. So I wouldn't want you to go away from this thinking that we can do this. But that is a very enticing goal and that is what's going to drive us so that we go from beyond the gamma test then, perhaps we would look at La Paz as being the delta test. So fish without footprints, it's a wonderful ideal. We've been able to show here that we have had the world's first ever unanchored drifter cage to go through a full grow out cycle. It's been the first ever fish farm in US federal waters. Is the future in US federal waters? Well, possibly, but perhaps it's also in high seas. If it's going to be in high seas, under what governance? Uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea hasn't really considered uh, aquaculture in international waters. The folks at FAO that I work with put their head in their hands and say, please, Neil, no, not yet, mm -hmm. when I ask them about this. What we are doing here is envisioning how we could green the blue prairies. Ocean agronomy is going to what's going to encourage people to be out there uh, in, in the oceans. In the same way that it was agriculture that encouraged people to move west of the Mississippi. Uh, we're going to pioneer this 
Yes, I'm a great fan of macroalgae, and as I said yesterday afternoon, macroalgae are the key to countering ocean acidification. But the initial pioneering of this is going to be with the high value species for the same reasons that the initial cell phones were for business, high flying business executives in New York City, those big clunky car phones. Now, cell phones are an economic engine for the developing world, but it took some time to get there, in the same way with open ocean aquaculture. Let's focus on the high-end species that are going to provide the highest returns. Later on, there'll be uh, all of those other attendant benefits there. And it's going to have to be stepwise. We're not about to go and do 10,000 tonnes out in the middle of the ocean here. Uh, our proposed, actually the, the farm site that we have already from the Mexican government in La Paz, bless the Mexican government, they understand the importance of aquaculture. We have a one square kilometre farm site down there that's five miles offshore. Uh, in about uh, 60 metres of water there. So perhaps we might think of La Paz, in, in terms of the expansion across the prairies, we might think of La Paz as St. Louis. The Sea of Cortez is an absolutely beautiful body of water. 600 miles of... Well, it, I, I, when I fly up and down uh, the peninsula from LA to La Paz and I look out at the Sea of Cortez, and I, I get the same sort of goosebump feeling that the first explorers when they hacked their way through the Blue Ridge Mountains and they saw the Ohio Valley and, and, and the Mississippi Valley and the Missouri Valley and the prairies beyond it and they must have said, somebody's going to grow a hell of a lot of food here one day. That's the way I feel about the Sea of Cortez. It's a beautiful body of water. It might be the, the, metaphor, the, the metaphor that we might use is, is if La Paz is St. Louis and the Sea of Cortez might be Kansas. When the history of sea setting is, is written, there will be Noah. And then somewhere after Noah, there will be Captain Bill Austin. No person does this by themselves. And we would have been uh, very much the sorrier if we hadn't had the expertise of this fine gentleman uh, working with us. And so I want to give thanks where it's due because uh, Bill and his crew were um, absolutely instrumental in, in making this work. Bill was out there for all but one week of, of the nine months uh, that we were drifting around there. The Coast Guard forced him to come ashore and have a, a, a cardiogram done. And he grumbled the whole time that he was ashore and he was ecstatic once he got back out there onto his boat. But it was also, there was extensive support from a number of organisations. Illinois Soybean Board, National Science Foundation, uh, International Copper Association had supported this with financing. Uh, Ocean Farms Technologies and Lockheed Martin had supported it with their, their work. NOAA, as I said, bless them, they are moving in the right direction. Uh, and, and the Honolulu office was very supportive of this. Uh, University of Hawaii at Hilo had conducted the uh, marine mammal monitoring. There was a very committed foam at the mouth, committed dive crew that worked with us there. Uh, it was a tremendous project. We look forward to the next steps into the blue beyond. Thank you very much.